Are you ready for the word? <clears throat> Amen. Bless God. Bless God. Bless God. I want to look at this next slide quickly, and I want you to uh, focus on the title. And in this title, there's an aspect of understanding, and it's not a bunch of scriptures. It's not a bunch of stuff. But sometimes two words could change your very life. And the reason I'd like for you to look at this, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have somebody cut the light off because there's something in a silhouette that I want you to see. Just quickly, it's not going to be long. Just want you to take a look at the title, look at the crown, and at the bottom of this screen, I want you to look at these people, the silhouette of these folks. And as I was going through and God was blessing and giving me what he wanted me to preach. He said, just keep it real simple today. It's not a lot of hoop and holler. It's not a lot of this, that, and the other. It's just the eternal nature of who you are blessed to have as your king. And see, here in this country, we don't understand kingship because we live in a democracy where everybody has a vote and everybody has a voice. And we bring that into our relationship with Christ. And there's a space God's going to bring us into where he said, just bring them back to all the things that I did even before he physically came into the earth. You can cut the light on. And I want you to look at the crown because the crown is not the crown that you would see other kings wear. It's not even a crown of suffering. It's actually a crown of authority where God says, I could do something different with my son that nobody else would ever do. There's not another king that ever wore this crown. And the crown brought pain and suffering and all this, but it brought freedom. And sometimes in our lives, we get to these spaces where we want things to look like a certain thing, and it doesn't look like what God wants you to receive. And he says to us in this moment where we are right now, he said, I need you to understand that when you accept my son, when you celebrate his birth, when you get to these things called whatever it is that we've decided Christmas is supposed to be, get back to the foundation. Get away from all the other stuff, all the frantic nature of your shopping, all the things that you do for wrapping gifts, all the stuff that you put pressure on yourself for because you put yourself in a space where you don't understand the eternal nature of his kingship. And there's some things that he's going to eliminate in just some very short verses, and the power of it will speak for itself. And so when I got up this morning, I said, you know what, God, what you want me to do? Everybody wear red for Christmas. And he said, put on the royal color of purple. Wear a tie because you're going to talk about my son. But still stay yourself. Don't ever become somebody else. Because when you know the king personally, It'll eliminate some stuff in your life that you wind up allowing to hinder your worship and praise of him. When I looked at those people with their hands raised in that silhouette, it was the coolest thing. That picture, whoever did that, they're permanently that way. Whenever you see that crown, you're going to see that silhouette and those people's hands are raised praising. Not just here in a building. Not just when it's going good, but they're going to praise the eternal nature of the king who, and this is the other thing about this king, this king said he loved you so much he laid his life down for you. There ain't a lot of leaders that'll do that. There ain't a lot of people that, I don't care how much you love your boo, all the rest of that kind of stuff, if it's a choice between you and them, mm, might be 50-50. But Jesus says, I love you this much that I know that my kingship has been established in heaven and on earth. And it's indisputable. There's no debating it. There's no aspect of opinion that you can have. You can't vote on Jesus' kingship. 
But this is the thing. You can live your life as if he's your king. And there's something that he's going to eliminate in these very first verses that I want to share with you right now. So stand to your feet. Let's look at what God is going to bless us to talk about for just a short period of time today. In Luke, the first chapter, and the 30th verse from the New Living Translation, it says, Don't be afraid, Mary. Say, don't be afraid. Then he talks directly to Mary, the the, uh, angel Gabriel, and he's saying, the angel told her, for you have found favor, say favor, with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. You may be seated. I just want to take you into a different, different space as we talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the eternal king. And I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, eternal king. Turn to your other neighbor and say, eternal Eternal. king. Now for yourself, say, eternal Eternal. king. Now this is the thing I need you to hear as God blesses. It was so important for Mary not to get shook in what she was going to do that God sent an angel, Gabriel, one of his powerful archangels, he sent down to have a direct conversation with her. And he said, I understand nature of what's going on with you and I need my angel to address the very thing that's going to cause you a problem and see for us in our lives I think at times we miss the aspect of what God does when he first has the person who's going to carry his son in her womb He said, there's something about the nature of what's going on on the inside of you that I'm going to have my angel address it because I don't want my child, stay here, ooh, freed me. I don't want my child subject to the emotional roller coaster that your body could take him through. See, that's why they tell mothers don't get in stressful situations when you're carrying the baby because you could mess around and put something in the child that don't need to be in the baby. And so what does he tell Mary at the very beginning? And stay with me because some folk going to get free right now. He tells Mary at the very beginning, I need you to understand something that when fear grips you, it's a problem. See, we want to go when he came into the world, but we need to go to the vessel that was going to hold him for a number of months before he was birthed into the world. It was so important that Gabriel spoke unto Mary that he sent the angel who was doing some awesome things for him just to have a conversation for a little while. He said, listen, I got something for you, and it's going to be way different, but this is the thing that I need you to understand, Mary. I need you to not be afraid. Go over the span of your life, and especially over this past year, there's some things in your life that you've been afraid of. And at this time where we're celebrating his birth, the very first thing that God wants to eliminate in Mary is what? Fear. He says, don't be afraid, Mary. I need you to understand I got this. I need you to understand, stay here, that you're going to go through some public ridicule, that some people are going to talk about you, that some people ain't going to understand how I am anointing and blessing you to do something that ain't never been done and ain't ever going to be done before again. But I need you to realize that the thing that might hinder you is fear. So first thing he speaks to is fear. He says, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. But watch this. He said, well, you're not afraid you can understand that actually you found favor. Stay here. There's some times in your life where you really want God to grant you or give you favor, but he tells Mary that she's found it. And it's not because Mary was like doing all this awesome stuff. Mary just happened to be the individual that God chose in a special way to do something amazing for him. And he said, in just your ability to be willing to do what I want you to do, I'm going to give you. You're going to find something that many people seek, but it can only be granted by me, and that is favor. And sometimes in our lives, we'll hear people say favor ain't fair, but favor only comes from God. And it's the thing that I began to realize and understand in this message and the power in it. I don't have to seek favor. That's why you got to be careful how you handle situations with people and stuff. 
Because you could want to find favor with men or favor with women and not get favor with God. And God said, listen, at the end of the day, the favor that you want is favor from me, and I'm going to give that. You found that in me, Mary. But I need you to understand what's going to happen, Mary. You're going to conceive, not by the natural way in which a man and a woman will come together. You're going to conceive because I'm just going to place my son on the inside of you. You're going to give birth to the son, and I'm going to tell you what you're going to name him. Stay here. I love God for this because Big Dog talked about this harmony aspect. And he said that when we are in harmony and one accord, that you can have three notes and things come together and everything work out okay. There's an aspect here. Stay with me for just a second. God is already doing something with Mary. He says, I need you to be in harmony with me right now. I need you to understand that this is a command. I need you to understand that there is no options in this. The baby name going to be Jesus. And it's not debatable. You may have felt, you may have thought, you may have said, when I conceive, I want to name the baby after the daddy. Joseph Jr. was not in the cards. But the baby name going to be Jesus. And I don't need, Mary, you to do anything other than just be who you are. Love God for this. Some of us trying to be everything else. This whole year, you've been trying to serve and, like, please people. And in your life, you're going to begin to realize and understand the only person, the only entity, the only triune being you got to please is God. And there's times in your life where you done tried to please people so much that you done given up aspects of yourself. And no matter what you do, they ain't going to be satisfied. God said, I need to free you from that right now. I need this aspect of his birth and your understanding of what it is that I'm doing to eliminate the fear in you that you think you're going to lose something. But you'll actually gain everything that you need if you just do it my way. And watch this. She's the only woman that goes through this particular experience that God blessed her to go through in order to be able to bring something into the world that God wanted brought into the world in his own way. But he's going to establish something, and then we're going to be done. He's going to establish something where his kingship and the eternal nature of it is both in heaven and on earth. So go to the next verses. So here he says, and I love God for this. In verse 32, he says to her, via, God says to her via the angel Gabriel, he says, he will be, and stay in these two words, very great. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are very great. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you are very great. Now for yourself, say, I am very great. Now, I want you to understand something that really all of us should understand in our relationship with Christ. Is that if you really is follower, you follow greatness. But you don't follow regular greatness. You're not tied to regular greatness. You don't have just regular things that God is going to do with you. He says here, he says that the son that's going to be born into the world will not just be regular great. He won't be ordinary. He won't be just run of the mill. He's going to be, and the Greek word for great is mega. He says, my son is going to be mega when he hits the world. He said, I need you to understand, my son is different than everybody else. He's mega. He's off the charts. He's ginormous. He's beyond your understanding. But he's going to be something that you need to realize is very great. And I want to do this as God blesses. In your life, stop settling for less. Stop settling for easy. Stop settling for comfortable. Because sometimes the good thing that you're doing is one step below the great thing God wants you to do in him. See, sometimes we like good, and good is cool because good feels nice, and good is easy sometimes. And we'll say, that was good, but was it great? 
Did it push you to a point where you were just like, hey, you know what? At the end of the day, there's a level of greatness that I am following in Jesus Christ. And God wants to do something in me that is great and not just great, but very great. Oh, stay here. I love God for this statement. There's some things in your life that you settle for and you haven't tasted what very great tastes like. Because your palate, I'll share this, it was funny, last night I was at the basketball game and my daughter Joy was able to eat this very hot, like, uh, meat stick she was eating. And one of the girls in the back, she turned to me and she said, your daughter's taste buds take on some stuff that I just can't taste. <laughs> and I said, that's because her taste buds have been burnt out of her mouth and she could just eat some stuff that not regular people can eat. Hmm. But I share that with you because there's something about the uniqueness of her taste buds that she could take on stuff that's very hot that other people can't. And there's a scripture that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And sometimes our palates have been set for just good. But our, our palates haven't been set for great. And sometimes in your life, and it's not a fault of any particular individual, we become so accustomed to good that when greatness comes around, we don't identify it. We look at it and we say it doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like, but in God, things ain't supposed to look like what you think they're supposed to look like. You got a king that wears a crown of thorns. You got a virgin that has a baby. You got a, a father-in-law, we're going to I mean, a, a stepfather who gets to a place in this relational connection where he says, listen, I'm not even, I'm going to put her away quietly. We ain't even going to let the public know. This situation that's happening, we don't want everybody to know our business, so I'm just going to put you away. And then he sends an angel to him and said, man, don't mess this thing up. And some of us need to know you right in the space God wants you to be in. It ain't got to look like the world wanted to look. It ain't got to look like your friends wanted to look. It ain't got to look like even the way you think it's supposed to look. He says he will be very great and will be called, ooh, love this, son of the most high. You know, when I started looking at that, I was just like, man, it's kind of cool. When you're son of the most high, that means that there's nothing that's above you. Stay here. It also establishes the eternal nature of the relational connection between God and his son, but it also establishes something in heaven. When we, you get in right relationship with Jesus, you'll understand that my Lord and Savior is son of the most high. When you are the most high, that means that there's nothing above you. And if I am a follower, watch this, of the son of the most high, then watch this, elevation should be a part of my DNA. Stay here. Son of the most high cannot guide me to low places. I'll get happy myself. But the son of the most high will get me to where the father is at. Because I can't get to the father but through the son. And the son is going to take me to some places I ain't seen before. Mm. Notice how God always took leaders to mountaintops. He said, when I get to this mountaintop, everybody can't go. But when I get you there, sit with me for a little while. Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Sinai. What I began to realize is that certain mountaintop experiences ain't for everybody. And sometimes you try to describe the mountaintop experience, and I don't get it. But watch this, stay here. Let's give you a Joshua Moses example. Moses would get to the top of the mountain and Joshua would sit a little halfway down. And at a certain point in time, God said to Joshua, once Moses had died, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. So now at this point, as Moses was up on mountaintops, he now needed to take Joshua, who stay here, to the very mountaintops or to mountaintop experiences that he had taken Moses through because he was going to now have him lead. See, greatness you got to be prepared for. In this new year, Lord willing, we make it to 2020. Check your mentors. Check the spaces you're in. If you ain't being prepped for greatness, if you're not being prepped for them mountaintop experiences, if you're starting to settle for less, ask yourself, am I really living out this aspect of being 
a disciple of the Son of the Most High? Or am I settling for just the things that the world wants me to settle for? Am I, am I okay with just this kind of stuff? I got into a space as God was blessing. He said, I want to take you to things you ain't never seen and give you experiences you ain't never had. But what I got to eliminate in you is fear. Fear of loss. Fear of ridicule. Fear of pain. Fear of sacrifice. Fear of all this stuff that the world wants you to hold on to. Fear of whatever it is. The only fear I need to have is a reverential fear of God. So I got here and I said he will be very great. Uh, and will be called the son of the most high. I'll stay here. That establishes an aspect of his spiritual eternal kingship. Stay here. See, the son of a king is a prince. And the thing about a prince is the prince should be what? He should be trained to become what? A king. Stay here. Men of God should live their lives being trained to stop being princes, but to step into leadership roles and to lead in a level that God would bless them to lead. And at this point in time, it shouldn't be where we settle and we say, hey, you know what? It's cool to just stay at the mediocre or, or, or the common or the ordinary level. The thing that Big Dog talked about, it was huge. He, in the scripture verse, it says that we're supposed to be in harmony. We're supposed to talk to ordinary folk. I love God for this. The thing that I've learned about the relational connection that I'm supposed to have with every person and the Bible, when it talked about the ordinary stuff in Romans 12, 16, it's interesting how you got to first identify with the ordinary nature of who you are to understand the extraordinary nature of God. Because he's the one that puts the extra in ordinary that makes it extraordinary. And at the end of the day, he says here, he says, the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. Stay here. Ooh. Stay in this space. And it's just an internal peace for each of us. What's the last thing you know that God gave you? Just stay in that space. We could say Jesus, right? And that's awesome. But what's the last thing that you know that God gave you that can never be taken away? It should be relational connection with Jesus Christ. And that should grow over time. And it should change and it should mature. And it shouldn't look the exact same way as it did in your past. It should actually get to a space where every single day he's taking you into a deeper space with him. But watch this. It's not just the eternal kingship that he has in heaven. It's actually what? It's an eternal kingship that he set here on earth. Because he says what? He says the Lord is going to give him something. He ain't got to work for it. He ain't got to do all this extra stuff. He ain't got to have a vote. None of this. He says the, Gabe, the angel Gabriel is saying unto Mary, he said, I'm going to give you the history of your son before he even gets on this earth. He's going to give him something. And he's going to give him what? The throne of his ancestor, David. See, God didn't just set up the, the spiritual kingship of Jesus. He set up his earthly kingship right here. Because he chose somebody in Joseph that was a part of the bloodline of David. He then took a virgin and made sure that she didn't have any relations with anybody else. So there was a level of holiness and purity in the whole situation. Then he said, and when people want to check your record, we ain't there. They're going to see that you come automatically from a line of kings. Now, check this out. If the birth of Christ did all that for Christ Jesus, and watch this, and he's king of kings and lord of lords, and I happen to be a child of his, and I'm covered by his blood, shouldn't that be some royalty? And how I act and how I live. Shouldn't I stop living as if I am a slave to the world and worldly desires when kings and queens aren't meant to be slaves? 
We should live in a level of what? Freedom and power and authority. Ain't got nothing to do with gifts because I got the greatest gift, which is Jesus. Ooh, stay here. But do I open my present every day? Or like some of us who buy toys for our kids, kind of set it to the side. I ain't playing with that one no more. <laughs> Give me the newer version. That old version don't work. And I was in a space. This guy was blessing. I was coming into the house today. And I said, God, do you mean to tell me that every one of us should be on a path towards a level of power and authority and, and, and really royal treatment in you? That, God, we got to stop settling for the stuff that we settle for? And watch this. And sometimes the very thing that's hindering you from right relationship with God is the stuff you like to do all the time. And sometimes he got to change your situation to change your situation. Oh, I love God for this. And then some of the things that he does, it's just a natural progression. He just gets you to a space, but you got to give yourself grace, space, and time. Because the thing was, when he told Mary that he was giving her favor, that she had found favor, when you look up the Greek for, word for favor, it's actually grace and peace. How many of us in this room would love to have grace and peace? But watch this. Once you get it, you can't just give it away. You got to hold on to it because it's something special. There's some power in grace and peace. So we get to this last part. He says, the Lord God, go back one. He, he gets to a space where he talks about the Lord God gives him the throne of his ancestor David. So he sets up not just his eternal nature and the kingship in heaven, but also on earth. And then he says that there's an aspect of what I want you to realize, mm, Mary, that your son is going to do something when he hits this world. And he's going to reign. That means he's going to have all power and authority in heaven and on earth. That means he's going to reign over Israel. Stay here. This is what eternal means forever. Mm. Now, see, forever is a very long time. Forever is like longer than your mind can comprehend. And watch this. There's some things that we do that have eternal impact. We just don't realize it. Like, there's some folk in my ancestry, and when I go through my DNA and I tie it back to God and all the rest of that, there's some people in my ancestry who came before me who actually paved the way for me to be standing where I'm at right now. There's some folk gave their life for us to be able to do certain things, and I began to realize not so much the older I get, but the closer I get to Christ. Because I used to think, well, it's the older that you get, but I know some folk who done got older but ain't got closer. And see, when you get in right relationship, you start to realize that, wait a second, man, all this other stuff don't make a difference. It's just some things about him. There's some stuff about him. There's some relational connection that I should have with him. Where when I realize that he reigns and he rules forever, then I need to change how I'm living now. Because his reign and his rulership don't stop. And watch this. And it shouldn't just be, I'm on my deathbed. I'm going to get it right. No, let me get it right now. Amen. Stuff I'm doing might not be right. Excuses I have made might not be right. I begin to realize and understand that some of the things that we make excuses about, we are hindering ourselves from eternal blessings. Somebody, stay here, somebody was on their knees hundreds of years before you even made it to this space. Some, some mother, some father, whoever it was, some uncle, some aunt, some loved one, some lo uh, godfather, whatever it is, they was on their knees and they said, God just bless those that come after me to be in right relationship with you. I'll give everything I got, God, just for them to be right. I know that I done lived my life, and maybe it was wrong at certain times, but, God, you could even help my wrong be right in you because I'm going to repent and get back to you. And I'm going to stop making excuses for the things that I'm doing. I'm going to stop going out here, God, just trying to say that the repentance carousel that I found myself on, eventually I want to get off that. 
I want to stop doing 360s and do a 180 and then just live my life in a 180 direction. And I always want you to be the front of me, God. I don't want to be, you know, off here and doing this and doing that. And it's the other thing I'm beginning to realize. There's some times in your life where God says, and now that I got you in right relationship with me, I need you to help some other people get in right relationship. But you can't help them get in right relationship if you just keep doing all the wrong things that they're doing. And that don't start with anybody else. That starts with us. And then there's a birth that happens. He brings him into the world. He establishes all this kingship and the level of authority that he has. But then he says this. He says it's not just that he's going to reign. He has a kingdom. <laughs> Stay here. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, now, which Disney world is it? You go to the one in Florida? Or you go to one in California. I said, I've been to the one in Florida a bunch of times. I said, I haven't been to the one in California. And when you go to the one, they said, welcome to where? The magic kingdom. And I was thinking to myself as I was preparing for this message. I said, you know what? At Christmas time and Merry Christmas and all the rest of us, you should really be telling people, welcome to God's kingdom. Because the kingdom is established when? When the birth of the son comes into the earth. Yes. He seals everything. He says, I'm already king up here. Yes. I've been around when the creation and all that other kind of stuff. I was there when my father was speaking and he was speaking all this stuff into existence. So my kingship in heaven has already been established. You guys here now need to understand that I have kingship on the earth. Right. So welcome. To my father's kingdom. Why do you think John the Baptist and all the rest of it? Repent for the kingdom of God is near or at hand. Why do he say all that? Because he said, listen, I need to change your mentality. You've been sitting around here thinking that you are just earthly beings and you are humans who are here. No, you are a part of a kingdom. And some of the stuff that you live your life by, the kingdom don't have democratic principles. Think it's a democracy, then you bring certain things into the household of faith. It was never meant to be that. We're always meant to be a part of a theocratic kingdom. Theocracy means that God rules everything. But watch this. But the nature of the society in which we live, you see all these people, and they, they pick their sides. <laughs> and I laughed at myself. You ain't got no side if it ain't God's side. And then we waste time, real talk. You waste time debating all the worldly stuff. I used to. I used to sit back. People used to give me, I think this, and I think that. And if it ain't God, what difference do it make? If it ain't putting people in his kingdom, what difference do it make? If it's dividing God's people, why are we not anti that? Why are we not like, my king is not into division, but into unity. My king actually has a kingdom that, watch this, that will never end. And I'm a part of that. So if what I'm doing is not moving people either towards the kingdom or building unity in the kingdom. Big dog, if I am not trying to live in harmony. Under God's rule, under God's authority. Now, the things that ain't of God, you're not supposed to be in harmony with that. You're not supposed to be like, okay, I'm light and darkness, and we're going to hang out and do this kind of thing. No, I'm going to shine the light in darkness, and if the darkness don't want to change, I'm going to continue to be the light. But how many times have we said, ah, no, I don't want to be that light, because light, <laughs> hmm, people don't always like light. But watch this, have you ever then sat back and thought to yourself, I'm making a temporal decision that will have an eternal impact. You shut your light off for just a moment. Accident happens. Oh, stay here. <laughs> Love God, but this did I got to be done. I began to realize this aspect of the eternal kingship a little bit different with the experiences that I've been having. And I recently just went to go get my car uh, fixed. 
And I took it over to Brondy's Ford, and it was the coolest thing. I take it over to Brondy's Ford, and as I'm going over to Brondy's Ford, I had gotten used to, stay here, I had gotten used to, the driver's side door stopped working. And so over a period of time, because I'm trying to make sure that I don't go into any financial indebtedness, I said, you know what, I don't want to go out here and spend this money. I'll just keep unlocking the door and doing all the rest of this kind of stuff, because I don't want to pay to get the actuator fixed. I said, I'm trying to save some money. I'm trying to be a good financial steward. And then I kept going over and all the rest of this kind of stuff, and I kept on trying to unlock the door, and it was different times, and it was starting to hinder stuff and all the rest of this. I said, you know what? I'm tired of doing this. I need to go over and go get my actuator fixed. We ain't there. See, some of us, the door ain't being open because your actuator is broken. You done got so used to trying to do it a particular way that you done not taking it in to the individual who could fix your actuator to get the door open. And watch this, I love how it is. And sometimes the reason the actuator is broken is because we don't understand that when the king say do it, you're supposed to just do it. Stay here. See, when I decided how I was going to do it, eventually I had developed in my mind that I'll do it a particular way to receive a particular outcome. Then he said, now wait a second, I done blessed you, stay here. He had blessed me with an additional income from coaching. He said, I've already taken care of this situation, so you already had the funds to be able to do it. Now, the only question is, are you going to be obedient unto me and get your actuator fixed? Because when the actuator wasn't fixed, stay here, I just, this is all tied together. When the actuator wasn't fixed, I couldn't open up the other doors from the inside. Right. We're not there. See, I was only focused on how the door will open up from the outside. I wasn't focused on the fact that the doors on the inside, I didn't have levels of control to be able to open them up. Stay here. When you sometimes lock the eternal king out. And your actuator ain't fixed. He want to get on the inside. This is good for me. He want to get on the inside of the car. Watch this. Because I needed to realize that I was not fixing the actuator for myself. I was actually fixing it for the driver of my car. The driver of my car is not me. It's Jesus. See, I had stayed in a, in a space where I said, eternal king, I don't need to fix it because I am the driver. He said, no, I'm the driver of that car. Get the actuator fixed so I can control the car. And when I get on the inside, I'll unlock the doors for everybody else. I had to get out of the driver's side. He had to check me on my driver's side mentality. Said, you ain't willing to sacrifice, but I done gave it to you. Be obedient. Do what I told you. That's why I said, stay here. Oh, dude, I got to be done. Because I have this thing in my car. Ooh, this is big. I had this thing in my car that when I start driving at a certain mile per hour, all the other doors will lock. Except when my actuator was broken, my door wouldn't. Some of us, since your actuator broke and the eternal king that told you to get in right relationship with him, he said, there's a danger that your door is going to open and eject you from the car. I don't want that to happen. So I need you to get it right. See, this should be about getting it right. It should be about your life being different from this point forward. You should walk out of here different. You should be different. It should be Merry Christmas, brand new life. Merry Christmas, welcome to the kingdom. Merry Christmas, get your actuator fixed. But live your life from this point forward for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because it ain't a debate, <laughs> it ain't an option, it ain't a vote. It's just him. So turn to your neighbor and say, I love, I serve the eternal king. Let's give God a huge hand clap of praise. Mm. 
One thing I want to make sure that we do, offer salvation and baptism and repentance to God's people according to his will. What I want you to do is I just want you to pray. Because if you don't know God for yourself and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and all the rest of that, and I'm cool with services and worship and all the rest of that, all this stuff is great. But at the end of the day, it's all about your relationship with Christ. None of these worship services are going to get you to heaven. That ain't what it is. Real talking ain't that. And at the end of the day, we can do all of this stuff, but if lives aren't being changed and people aren't committing themselves to God, then all we're doing is just getting together. So I want to give you the opportunity. And this is the other thing. I want to challenge you with this as God has challenged me, and it's biblical. Make sure that you take the word of God out to other people. Amen. Everybody ain't going to make it to here. Everybody ain't going to be in this house. Make a concerted effort that when you're on your job, talk to them ordinary folk that don't know Christ. Real talk, the ones that you see and you can identify that they have an issues, go talk to them. And I'm going to share this. And you might be the person who needs some encouragement and support. Find somebody that's a believer and see if you can touch and agree with them. People go through a whole lot of stuff. I'm beginning to realize that the places that God has my feet to be set is because he knows that there's people who either don't know him or need a encouragement in their relationship with him. And they ain't going to come here. Just not. And I'm cool with that. It's not an aspect of that. But I do believe that when you're here, you should be given the opportunity to be able to receive him if you haven't received him. And also, real talk, if you haven't repented and ain't in right relationship, take the time out. If you ain't been in right relationship, man, just get back to dad. And if you want to be baptized, we'll talk about baptism, right? And every person that's going to be baptized here at GCDC, I'm going to talk to you about what it means, all the rest of that. And there are going to come times where you may want to know, what does it take to actually be a part of this household of faith? And we'll talk to you about that too, right? So there are elders that are here. If you need intercessory prayer, all that kind of stuff. We'll do all of those things. But the most important thing is for you guys to have a right relationship with Christ. So I want to do, just bow your head, close your eyes. I'm going to ask God if there's anybody that he wants to come, they'll come according to his good and perfect will. And then if not, we're going to continue to move forward. So bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, right now, I just ask that you seal this message by the power of your word. And God, if it's penetrated the heart of any person here who is not in right relationship with you, God just doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. I ask that you quicken their feet according to your will. Bless them, God, to come up or to talk to us after service, God, to be able to uh, just receive Jesus. And, God, if there's somebody here who just needs to repent, God, I ask that you place it in their heart that today is a day for them to do just that. And, God, if they want to have a conversation after, we're always open and willing. And God, anybody that wants to put on the symbolic death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, give them that opportunity. Bless them to understand what the power of baptism is. And God, I will ask as we sit here and pray and as you touch the hearts of your people that if anybody wants to be a part of this household of faith, that wants to be devoted to you and carry out discipleship in this house, that God, all of your people are praying now that if anyone meets that category, that you bless them that you quicken their steps. And God, if it's your will and if it's their time, let them come now. But God, let them always know that their brothers and sisters in Christ are always present for them to come and receive salvation, repentance, baptism, or discipleship, partnership, or membership with us. And as you seal this prayer, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask that you bless as only you can and keep as only you can. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. All right, with that being said and done.